Good morning, everyone. Welcome this Palm Sunday morning. We are going to start with the purplish handout in your bulletin, Jerusalem. And I'll invite you to join me in standing as we sing these four verses. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Lord, we're, we're thankful to gather this morning and to think about Palm Sunday and how the people cheered and uh, just were glad to, to see you. And then we think about how during the week the people turned on you and um, it was such an ugly week, but it ended with you giving your life for us. But we thank you that you came to save us and we ask that you'll be with us this week as we try to remember that as we celebrate Easter and celebrate what you've done for us. And we ask that you'll be with us in our Sunday school lessons this morning. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Let's do a memory, some memory verses. Good. Alan Sally's class.
good. Fourth, fifth, and sixth. Good. The youth group. Philippians 1.21 For he managed to live as Christ and to die as gain. Philippians 1.21 Good. The adults. Good. We're going to do April birthday, so unless you have an April birthday, you may be seated. Let's see here. I have a list here. I'm wondering who's cheating. <laughs> all right, let's sing happy birthday to all these April birthdays. I think I should take a minute and ask how old a few of you are going to be. Micah? Five. You're going to be five. Mason? How? Nine? Oh, I thought he said five for a second. I was like, no, that can't be right. Okay, I'm going to stop there. All right, I'll invite everybody to join them standing. <laughs> and we'll sing the fourth verse of Jerusalem as they're dismissed to their classes. Oh, I'm <laughs> you're all staring at me like, no, we're not going to do that. Because <laughs> I totally forgot we're going to do a catechism. So what's the question today? <laughs> Did God create us unable to keep his law? No. <laughs> but because of the disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, all creation is fallen. We are all born in sin and guilt corrupt in our nature, and unable to keep God's law. Okay, can we now be dismissed? <laughs> yes, yay, the fourth verse of Jerusalem. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, sounds like I'm on full blast. If anybody needs a verse card, raise their hand. And Pastor Norton has them for April. And if anybody needs a worksheet from last week, Pastor Norton will hand you one of these also. 
how come you moved back a row? I don't have any locusts today. <laughs> I did. Yep. I think when it snowed the other day, they didn't fare so well. All right, we do call this Sunday school. And I can remember when I was in school, we had pop quizzes. Well, we're going to have some pop quizzes today. And we're going to be in the book of Joel. So you can make your way there. And the pop quiz is pretty easy. The only hard part is I get to call on you. So if you're kind of looking away like this, that may be uh, your downside because I will call on you. Okay, I need, when I call on you, you need to just tell me one thing about the book of Joel or about the day of the Lord. One thing. It can be as simple as Joel is in the Old Testament. Could be as simple as Joel was a man. So um, I'm going to ask, yeah, I'm going to start with that, so be thinking about it, one thing. And uh, let's see, let's start with Phyllis. <laughs> one thing, Phyllis. Yes, okay, Bill, one thing about Joel. Okay. Okay, very good. Yep. <laughs> you were going like this. No, I just don't know anything. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, is Joel in the Mormons book? No. Where is Joel? Okay, you're good. You're good. Yes, Mr. Stout. Okay, very good. Marsha, one thing about Joel or the day of the Lord. Perfect, perfect. Mike, <laughs> I saw you looking down. One thing about the book of Joel or about the day of the Lord. Yes, that is, that is mentioned a couple of times. I like to pick on the people that don't say a lot. Darrell Bolter. <laughs> oh, you're going to raise your hand now. Darrell, one thing about the book of Joel or about the day of the Lord. What can you tell me? Just one thing. Judgment. Yes. Yep, that's right. Richard? Okay, like I said, I was going to ask people that didn't say a lot, Janice. <laughs> One thing about the day of the Lord or something from the book of Joel. Call to repentance. Is she right? Yes, yep. Tyler. Absolutely right. He is a minor. Why is he the minor prophet? Short book. Yep. That's that's true too. Doug, you just said that, so I wouldn't call on you. All right, we will get to the book of Joel. It's going to be starting on chapter two. Also. Did, nobody needed a worksheet from last week. Uh, Phyllis printed off a thing for me last week, and it just helps to cover the day of the Lord. If anybody wants one, I only printed 20, but if somebody wants one for a little further reading, he will get it to you. And 
And I don't have my Bible yet open to the book of Joel. Does anybody that has something they'd like to comment on Joel that because, and I didn't call on you? Does anybody want to help with the book of Joel? Anybody got a comment? Anything from last week maybe that hit them during this week? Okay, I am going to do just a little bit of uh, going back over the book or the first chapter of Joel, and we got most of it covered. The first chapter of Joel talks about the locust uh, coming in, destroying Jerusalem. We think that that happened earlier, um, and then uh, the Lord was using that as a uh, springboard to get ready to talk about the day of the Lord. Um, and it was quite devastating. <clears throat> and um, then there was the drought. And so Jerusalem really was going through a tough time at that time. And then in chapter 2, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. Some people look at chapter 2 that it's the second invasion of locusts. I'm not really sure that I'm going to hold to that. I'm going to stick with the thought that it's either the Assyrians or the Babylonians that come into Jerusalem and um, basically devastate Jerusalem again. Um, and we kind of liken that again to the day of the Lord. Um, is the day of the Lord just like one day or do we, should we look at the day of the Lord as an event? As an event, yes. That, that is true. We don't want to get confused and say, oh, we're, we're going to be looking at one day. We're not. We're looking at an event. Um, and, then, and in chapter 2, I'm going to hold it, like I said, that, that looks like the Assyrian army or possibly the Babylonian army that comes in later and presents the smaller day of the Lord because we still have the day of the Lord that we're going to see in Thessalonians, that's future. And then when we get into the book of the Revelation, the big picture of the day of the Lord. One of the things that kind of helps me think about the, when we're looking at the day of the Lord is when we're looking at Israel, it's basically just the day of the Lord for Israel. When we get into the book of Revelation and we're looking at the day of the Lord, it's more of a worldwide uh, day of the Lord, that the judgments are more worldwide nation, uh, that way uh, than just Israel. And we looked last week that some of the other nations had their day of the Lord, that judgment came on them. What was one of the things that the nations or even us as an individual can do that we can miss the day of the Lord? What did the Lord provide to miss the day of the Lord? What could we do? Repentance. The Lord gave an opportunity before all of these day of the Lords to repent. And that is, uh, that is, that's just a characteristic of our Lord. We can avoid hell if we repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We will not have to go through judgment for our sin. And like I said, the Lord is gracious and he will hear that prayer okay then in chapter 3 actually it starts about 2 two eighteen. Uh, Joel chapter 2 verse 18 the day uh, it goes into the day of the Lord again but this is the major one that we're going to see in Revelation and we'll go through some of that um, so let's now, let's do question one before we get into chapter two of Joel and read through that. In chapter, chapter two, verse 12 of Joel, he says, 
Return to me with all your heart. I want repentance. Turn back to me. What are some of the ways that God can convict us of our sin? What, what are some of the ways? Kenny. Consequences. Yep. If we think ahead and we think, if I do this, I might be in jail. Okay. What are another one? Mr. Stout, I always want to call you Keith. <laughs> Our feelings, yes. God built within us a conscience. And that if we don't sear that conscience, will convict us. How about music, singing a song? Can a, can a song convict us of sin? Yes. Yep. Uh, Bible preaching. The Bible convicts us of sin. Um, nature. I'm not sure if nature can really convict us of sin, but we can see in nature the attributes of God. How about other people's lives? Can other people's lives convict us of our sin? Who says yes? Okay. Who says no? Okay. I agree. I think I have a brother-in-law uh, one of Chris's brothers, and I don't really like to be around him too much. He's a good Christian man, but he convicts me of how you should treat your wife. And he treats his wife as she should be treated and according to Scripture. So when I'm around him, I'm going, man, he treats his wife good. And I'm convicted of not treating Christine the way I should. So, like I said, other people could convict us of sin. Um, there's a few other people that can convict me of sin. Um, someone that doesn't get angry. And that's not me and Tyler. That's why we didn't put windows in our garage. Because that tool might take the window out. But there's some people I'm going, I've never seen him get mad. And then all of a sudden, it starts to convict me. Okay. Um, let's do question two before we start in with uh, the ch second chapter of Joel, because it does talk about God's judgment upon man. <clears throat> and in today's world, do people really see that there's a war coming and that war is going to be against God? if you are on the wrong side, if you're not a believer, and we see it in the book of Revelation, we're going to see it here. Do people really see that, you know, we're worried about China, but do people today really think that we're going to go to war with God? Phyllis. Oh, yeah, that might be a big problem there. They don't even acknowledge that there's God. But I, I just don't see people are really thinking about a war with God. Now, you and I do because we can open the scriptures and as we look at Joel and Revelation and uh, they call it uh, the Valley of Decision later and the Valley of Jehoshaphat where God is going to uh, massacre millions of people. They say the blood's going to run as deep as the bridle of a horse. But yet, I just don't see where people see there's going to be war with God. We're going to have a reckoning day. Um, so let's jump in and read some verses in Joel chapter 2 and go through these. And as we're reading this, remember it says uh, at the tail end of Joel chapter 1, it says, Alas, for the day of the Lord is near. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, for the day of the Lord is coming. So the locust was a day of the Lord in the past. And what most people, as we read this, some people think it's the second attack of the locust. I don't think that exactly fits, and I'll show you why. I think it deals more with Assyria or Babylon coming back in and devastating Jerusalem. So let's jump in at chapter 2, verse 1. And my voice is fading, so 
Just bear with me. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the dawn spread is spread over the mountains. So there is a great and mighty people. Great and mighty people, not great and mighty locust as a second invasion. That's one of the reasons I think it's another army coming in, not the locust again. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be anything after it for the years of, my gen of many generations. A fire consumes before them and behind them a flame burns. And this is describing, I think, the attack of the army that will eventually come into Jerusalem. A fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before they came, but a desolate wilderness behind them when they leave. And nothing at all escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like war horses, so they run with a noise as of a chariot. They leap on top of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of a fire consuming the stubble. Once again, like a mighty, mighty people arranged for battle. Right now he's going to be describing this Assyrian army and how they're organized and how they uh, will conquer and they're very well taught. And let me see, where did I leave off? Let's start at uh, verse 6. Before them, the people are in anguish. They're scared of them. All faces turn pale. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like soldiers, and they each march in line. They do not deviate from their paths, and they do not crowd each other, stumble and fall over each other. They march everyone in his path. When they burst through the defenses, they do not break rank, ranks. They rush on the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. Before them, the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness, and the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome, and who can endure it? And once again, I think that he's talking directly just to Israel uh, on, on another event that we're going to call the day of the Lord. I don't think it's the day of the Lord that we read in Revelation. I'm not going to put it that far ahead. Um, in 722 or 732, uh, 732, the Assyrians come in and devastate Jerusalem. And I think that's what this is a picture of. And so the Lord has given Israel like two warnings of, of the day of the Lord. Okay, get prepared. You, if you repent, I may draw this back. This may not happen. I don't think they repented. I think that obviously history shows that they came in and they devastated Israel again. Um, let me go back and hit a few high points of what I just read, okay? Let me see here. Okay, in, uh, right back to the beginning. In chapter 2, verse 2, it says, It's a day of darkness and of gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And that is going to be for Jerusalem. I think that's more spiritual. I think that they're uh, going through a tough time. They realize what's coming on and they're getting destroyed. Because Assyria could have came in on a clear, bright, sunshiny day. So I think that that is talking about their spiritual outlook on life, their, their mental thinking. You know, they're just getting destroyed by the Assyrians. And so he, he calls it a day of clouds and thick darkness. Now, when we go to the book of Revelation and we look at what we're going to call the day of the Lord, we see the same thing, a day of clouds, thickness, and darkness. But I don't think that's so much spiritual when we read it in the book of Revelation. 
I think that that's some of the things that the Lord, when he opens up these vials and all these bowls, I actually think that they're going to, it's actually going to be darkness. It's not going to be a spiritual darkness. It's going to be the Lord and his vengeance coming after them. And so I kind of make a little bit of a difference there. Um, let's see here. And as we read that, it's the Assyrian army, the fire consumes them. They were a well-organized army. Jerusalem was just overwhelmed. There's, there just wasn't much they could do um, to stop that. Um, and, and as I look at China, and I think it's Taiwan, if China wanted to go into Taiwan, that's not going to be... <laughs> That will be a massacre. China is a huge nation, and, you know, here's a little Taiwan. They're not going to be able to do much. And I kind of see that that's how Assyria came in and destroyed Jerusalem. I tried to find things on the Assyrian army and what they actually did in Jerusalem, and I couldn't really find a lot of history on, on the devastation they left, but from what we see here in scripture, they really devastated them. And what was the reason that the Assyrians came in to Israel? What's the very main reason for that? Phyllis? Judgment. Yep. Judgment on Israel. Yep. It wasn't because they wanted, well, it might have been in the Assyrian eyes. Oh, they've got all this. You know, they've got fruit valleys. They have a lot of gold and all the Assyrians. That's why we're going there. No, that's not why you went there. God is in control. God is sovereign. You're going there to correct my people. They have been sinning, and they're going to pay the price for that sin. Any thoughts on this? Okay. Let me pick up. And I'm going to drop down and start in verse 12 of chapter 2. And it says, Yet, even now, declares the Lord, you return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and you, <coughs> excuse me, and you rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and compassionate, slow to slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Who knows whether he will not turn and, and relent. That is a verse for you and I to keep in the back of our heads every day. Return to me when you sin. Turn back to him. One of our favorite verses out of the New Testament should be John 1, 9. And what does that verse say? Yes. You know, I could almost say that about every three hours um, because I am a sinful creature. And the Lord has given Israel that time, and he gives us that time. Repent and return to me. And he says, return with your heart. Uh, don't tear your garments. Back in that day, if you tore your garments, that meant that you were trying to repent. Well, that's a pretty easy way out of repenting. Oh, uh, okay, yep, I've repented. It's much deeper than that, and that's what the Lord's driving at here. Just because you tear your clothes, is that really true repentance? No, no. Nope. He says, render your heart, tear your heart, and that's what he wants from us in our lives is that we open our hearts, that we grab a hold of our hearts and we repent from the heart. It's not an always easy thing to do. It would be a lot easier just to rip my clothes and then have it over with, but that the Lord goes much deeper than that. Um, and isn't this a great picture of our Lord for you and I who have been saved and confess our sins and we walk with the Lord? Joel is telling Israel... Here's what the Lord is really like. Well, you and I who have asked Christ into our lives, we know this. And let's read that again. Return to me with all your heart, 
with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garment. Now return to the Lord, for he is gracious and compassionate. Can I get an amen on that? Is that the way your Lord is? My Lord is. He is gracious and compassionate with me. He's slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. That's, that's a picture of my Lord that I walk with. And that's, that's what we want the world to see, is what it says here. Slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. I am so glad that I don't get what I deserve. I get it occasionally on Tuesday nights from Don Sleeman. Um. <laughs> But I don't get it from the Lord. He is full of compassion and relentless to love me. Let's start up in verse 13, or no, in 15. And what we're kind of seeing is the Lord is hoping that Israel will repent. And so he's kind of laying it out here as we've gone through and he's wanted the people to render their heart, not their clothes. So in verse 15, he says, Blow a trumpet in Zion. Concentrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. And once again, he's going through every walk of life. We've got the baby child. We've got the, uh, the bridegroom who's just getting ready to marry. And he's saying, your marriage that you're getting ready to do isn't as important as repenting right now with the nation of Israel. So we've got the child. We've got the bridegroom. Uh, in 17, verse 17, let the priest, the Lord's ministers, let them weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. Do not make thine inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should the people say, where is their God? In verse 17, what the, uh, Joel is saying or the Lord is saying, if you let Israel be destroyed by the Assyrians, this is maybe what the nations around Israel is going to say about their God. Uh, he wouldn't spare his own people. Uh, that his inheritance, he's going to make them a reproach. But that's not the truth because we're going to see what happens at the end of Revelation. In verse 18, okay, now we kind of change. Uh, we're going to be looking more. I think now this deals more with the day of the Lord that we see in the book of Revelation, what we see in the first. First Thessalonians. And I have to be careful when I say revelation. Every once in a while, I like to say revelations. And I think Pastor Branham, he's close now. So if he hears that, I'm, I, I've got my cell phone off so he can't call me. But boy, he used not like you to say revelations, did he, Pastor? He did not like that. And of course, me with a loose tongue, I've, I was probably guilty of that. So like I said, we've kind of changed gears now. Now we're going to deal with the day of the Lord in capital letters. And it says, then the Lord will be zealous for his land. He will have pity on his people and the Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I am going to send your grain, new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied in full with them. And I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. Now, he's talking about in the future, not right now. It's going to be at the end of the millennium. Is that the, at the end of the tribulation period? Okay. So he's looking ahead. He says, but I will remove the northern army far from you, and I will drive it into parched and desolate land and its vanguard into the eastern sea. 
and its rear guard into the western sea, and its stench will rise, and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the land has for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green. He's restoring Israel in this picture here. In verse 22, do not fear, beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green. For the tree has borne its fruit. The fig tree and the vine has yielded in full. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and later rain as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with the new wine and the oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust. Now, remember, this is in the future, way in the future, even beyond our day. And you shall have plenty to eat and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. Then my people will never be put to shame. And see, if we try to apply this to the Assyrian army that we just read about, and it says, then my people will never be put to shame. That doesn't fit. Israel has had a hard time. They have brought it, most of it on themselves. But when we look at Israel's history, even in today's world, he says, my people will never be put to shame. Is that the case? That wasn't the case in World War Probably World War One and World War Two. Israel was just oh, millions and millions in the concentration camp. Right now, everybody around Israel sends bombs into them. Um, you know, we have these hate crimes, and the Jewish people are right there. So to say that my people will never be put to shame, I, I can't apply that yet. I can't apply it yet to today. It's got to be in the future. Uh, in 27, verse 27, Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. And my people will never be put to shame. He brings that up again. And once again, we're starting to see in this a national Israel being where they should be. Um, in verse 28, he's going to start a spiritual restoration for Israel. He's going to bring them back to himself. Um, they aren't going to be going. Uh, future. In verse 28, and it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions, and even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. I'm going to stop right there for a minute. We have what I believe in Acts, and I think it's Peter. He does this, I believe, in a smaller way. And then I think, again, we're going to see it at the end of the millennium or at the end of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation. So Peter gives us a little small resemblance of what he sees here. But at the end of the tribulation it's going to be much bigger on a bigger platform and that what is to me what makes Joel kind of hard uh, these chapters two and three because you have a little small day of the Lord and then you have the great big day of the Lord and then again here we see that he says I'm going to pour out my spirit your sons and your daughters will prophesy and some of that happened in Acts at Peter's sermon but I still think the bigger picture is at the end of the tribulation. So 
If you're confused, so am I. And like I said, it's just hard to figure out, you know, when he, when he reads it off because you can say, well, that happened to Peter. Well, yeah, but I think there's a bigger picture coming. Okay, let's start in 29. And even on the male and the female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood, but the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. Once again, there's our Lord. There's, he's, he's got the door wide open again for repentance. He's, and he, like he says, uh, that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be delivered. Some of the best verses that I've had that I hold tight. There will be those who escape, and I'm going to be one of them. And as the Lord has said, even among the survivors, the Lord calls. Chapter 3, any thoughts? Have I got everybody confused? I do? Okay, we'll see Phyllis after class. Chapter 3. And once again, I think this is the big day of the Lord that he is going to be describing here. It says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations, and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I think right now we're starting to look at Revelation when this is starting to take place. Then I will enter into judgment with them, with all the nations, on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and they have divided up my land. And what he's describing right now is the way the people treated Israel, the way they persecuted Israel. And he's remembering all that from the past and he's getting ready to judge these nations. And he remembers what they did to the nation of Israel. Um, I will start in verse 3. And these, once again, this is more of what they've done to Israel. They have also cast lots for my people. They have traded a boy for a harlot. They have sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Moreover, what are you to me, O Tyron and Sidon and all of the regions of Philistia? Are you rendering me a recompense? But if you do recompense me swiftly and speedily, I will return recompense on your head. Since you have taken my silver and my gold and bought my precious treasures to your temples, have they done that? Has that been done in past history? Yes, they've raided Israel and took all those things out of there. And you have sold the sons of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far <clears throat> far from their territory. Behold, I am going to arouse them from the place where you have sold them and return your recompense on your head. Once again, he's doing judgment on the nations that were evil to Israel. Also, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the sons of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans and to a distant nation, for the Lord has spoken. Um, and so now in verses 9, and I'm not going to read all that again, but in verses 9, 10, and 11, he's telling these nations, we're going to be going to war, and we're going to be going into the valley of Jehoshaphat. So do whatever you can, you evil nations. If you think you can fight against me and win, then, then come on. The Lord says, I'm ready. Are they going to win? No. No. The Lord remembers everything they've done against him. Let's go up to verse 12. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And you can cross-reference that to 
Revelation 27. Once again, in 15, it says, The sun and the moon grow dark, the stars lose their brightness, and the Lord rolls from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth tremble. But the Lord is a refuge for his people. Another great verse to grab onto. And a stronghold to the sons of Israel. Okay, I'm going to stop and I ask a question. And as I did more studying, <laughs> question three is a little bit deceptive, but I'm still going to use it. It says, are you in the valley of decision? Have you decided that you're going to accept Christ? Or are you thinking maybe not? Or maybe if you're in that position, you need to decide. Jesus Christ is your Savior. Are you in a valley of decision over a sin? No, I kind of like that sin. I'm going to hold on to it. If you're in that valley, if you're trying to decide over a sin, get rid of it. And, I, and when, I, when I ask this question, and in my further study, as we see in verse 14, 314, um, it says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Well, the valley of decision is going to be what the Lord does against the people. It's not whether we're going to choose the Lord. In the valley of this decision here, it's the Lord is deciding what I'm going to do with these nations, what I'm going to do with this people. We're not deciding, oh, I'm going to take the Lord. That's not, I, I misled you with that question. The valley of decision is the deciding what the Lord is going to do with the evil nations. Am I correct, Phyllis? All right. I didn't know that last week, or I wouldn't have asked that stupid question. The, the question would be, if you are in uh, a spot where you need to make a decision, you are in that the valley of decision. The one here from the scriptures is God is going to decide what he's going to do with the nation. So you may have a decision over, I'm going to quit driving 75 miles an hour down Banfield Road. You're in the valley of decision. I hope you decide, yes, I'm going to stop doing that. Oh, you're not going to stop? Oh, you don't drive that fast. Okay. You, you go down Pfeiffer Road that fast? Good, because I live on Pfeiffer Road. Oh, you drive 75. Okay. And that's what I mean by the valley of decision. We don't want him driving 75 down our road, do we? No. <laughs> So when I ask that question, and like I said, further in my studies, I realize that the valley of decision is, is God deciding what he's going to do with mankind, the evilness of mankind. Okay, uh, let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to end up there. And like I said last week, I am kind of thinking that... Um, this progressive revelation because Joel was basically the springboard for the theme, the day of the Lord. And now we get to Thessalonians and we're going to learn just a little bit more about the day of the Lord. Okay. First Thessalonians chapter five, and I'm just going to read that. <clears throat> and like I said, this relates to the day of the Lord. And I believe this is the, capital day of the Lord, okay? I'm in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And the Thessalonians were having some trouble with the day of the Lord. Some of them thought they'd missed it. Uh, there was actually a letter, I think, that was being circulated that was non-scriptural 
but saying all the day of the Lord is past, and it's not true. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. And there he refers to um, the, a false letter. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come. Now, the day of the Lord that we looked at in Joel with the locusts and the invading army, that really didn't come like a thief in the night. So to me, there's a little difference. This day of the Lord here says it's going to come like a thief. When the Assyrians were coming, they could see him out there coming. They could see the locusts coming in. But the day of the Lord that he's speaking about here, it's going to come that quick. And what happens that quick? Our rapture. Yep. And so it says that the day of the Lord, and once again, we're learning a little bit more about the day of the Lord. It says that it's going to come like a thief in the night. And while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pang upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. We should know, hopefully, a little bit more about the day of the Lord than we did three weeks ago. If not, I have failed. But brethren are not in darkness that the day of the Lord should overtake you like a thief. We should know. For you are all the sons of light and the sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober and looking ahead for the day of the Lord. Um, I am going to close up, I think. That has covered everything. Um, any thoughts, any questions, uh, comments? Really, I guess I don't want any questions, um, but you certainly can make a comment. Richard. Yes. It will. Yep, it will. The Lord is going to destroy the enemies. Any other Thoughts or comments on this, Mr. Stout? So you've decided you're not going to drive 75 miles an hour down my road. Okay, go ahead. Absolutely. Yes. We do. Yep. And like I said, 1 John 1, 9, I need to run to that verse about every three hours. And... So next week, we're going to be in, I believe, the book of Amos, correct? Who's teaching? Pastor Norton. Pastor Norton, okay. And once again, we're in the Minor Prophets. And in the book of Joel, we get he mentions the day of the Lord again. And so there's a little more teaching on that in the book of Amos. Yes. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so next week, Tuesday... But you still can come Sunday. I'd like you all to come Sunday. Yes. against the Jewish people. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Well, you're right. And he judges all nations. Yep. So let's go ahead and close up in prayer. Oh, also, I want to thank all of you for the cards that I've received in the mail and the prayers that you have sent my way um, for the passing of my dad. And like I said, there's no other place I would rather be right now than in this church. So thank you. So let's close. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for today and your great love for us and that we can learn to rest in that. 
You know, as you look at the book of Joel, we see that you always give us room for repentance. And so, Lord, you are a gracious and caring God. And we just pray for the morning service to come, that the word that is preached will change our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.